I'm sure you've heard of the saying that behind every good man, there's a good woman. And the same is true. Behind Brutus is Portia. Behind Caesar is Calpurnia. Today, we're going to talk about the education of women and the Roman conception of marriage, specifically Portia and Calpurnia. So before we do that, we have to take a look at the relationship between both Portia and her husband Brutus. Now, what's interesting to note in the text is that Portia, when she arrives on the scene, she is the first, it's the first time that a woman is heard in the text. Now, remember, we meet uh, Calpurnia earlier in the text, but we don't hear from her, right? Her husband, Caesar, speaks to her and sort of uh, directs her to put her hand on someone's shoulder, but we never hear from her. She's silent. But Portia is the first woman to establish a voice in the text. And when she does that, um, we see that Brutus then questions her. Why? You know, he questions her. If you look in the text, that's the first thing he does is, is she opens her mouth, she says something, and he questions her. Um, he refers to her as weak, and he connects her to the language like raw, cold morning, right? So you would expect that, that Portia might um, be submissive or even uh, retreat. But in this case, she mirrors his response. So if he comes at her, she's going to be coming equally and meet him at the same place. Um, in this case, what it does is it signifies, or at least she's attempting to signify, that a man is equal to a woman. So if he's sick, or she's sick, rather, um, then he too is sick, right? And we see that she sort of challenges Brutus um, in the text. So what this does is it shows that there's a potential for sickness in both. One is sick, the man is sick, and the woman is equally ill. So we know already, and these two images are of Calpurnia and Portia, we know that the women have some sort of sickness, right? We look at, at, at um, Calpurnia, and we know that she is unable to conceive. She's barren. They tell us that in the very uh, first act of the text. Right, remember when Caesar directs her to put her hand on the man's shoulder, so that might pr provide, make, he was superstitious, and that might make her um, able to conceive. So she cannot have children. And then we have um, Portia, who mutilates herself. And in modern day, we see that if someone, you know, cuts themselves, uh, then they're crazy. There's something wrong with them. So in this case, that's her sickness as well. Okay, so if the women are sick, then the men are equally sick. And we see this pattern of sickness in the text. We start with Brutus. Brutus is going through this turmoil. Everyone is coming to him. He clearly is weak, right? Um, he's indecisive, but he has that own, maybe perhaps even a sickness in the head. And then we meet Ligarius, who, if you recall, he was part of the, the conspirators, but he was too ill to meet with Brutus that evening um, when all the other conspirators arrived to talk to Brutus. He was too ill. So he too was sick. And then we have Caesar, which we know suffers from epilepsy, or if you recall, the falling sickness, right, the fainting, um, and, and partially, and he has a deafness. So there's a pattern of sickness in both the men and the women throughout the text. So this leaves us with Portia. She has this female dilemma, right? She has the mind of a man and the woman's might. And so what you don't know is that she's really smart. And so you probably recognize in the text when you see, you probably say, wow, Portia is bad. Like she's not a bad person, but she's a bad girl, right? Um, she confronts Brutus with the truth. She's not backing down from Brutus. We can sense her strength. She possesses the education of a man. Right? She's daughter to Cato, and Cato was a courageous, mighty um, man and, and warrior. And then, but at the same time, she also has the might of a woman. She exhibits excessive amounts of emotion. She's a good daughter. She's a dutiful Roman wife. She begs her man, in this case, um, Brutus, to open up to her. Please, she'll go to great lengths, right? Um, she's driven to madness, and, and she's insistent. Um, and she becomes at some point hysterical, right? 
And so this is her dilemma. She's stuck between two worlds. She is this woman, and that's how she is defined physically. But at the same time, you know, she she's strong. So it's very difficult for her, and we find that she can't be silent. She can't lose her voice in the text. So what's interesting to also note is the hysteria that Shakespeare um, sort of projects onto the women in his text, not just Julius Caesar, but Hamlet. And that there are other texts too. The women sort of um, come across as crazy, right? And, and, and perhaps because, and, and the better word might be powerless, right? Because the men in this case possess the power. The women have the, possess the inner strength, but they, they can't do anything with it. So it drives them crazy. And in this case, we see um, Portia, she stabs herself um, in, in the thigh. We find that out as well. And then if you look at Hamlet, and you'll, you'll read that perhaps um, at a different level, um, there's a character, Ophelia, who's driven to hysteria or madness as well. There's a saying, you know, is Ophelia crazy? Um, and so there's something about the text and, and, and Shakespeare's work that sort of uh, communicates this idea that the women are just not all there. We know that is not the case, right? So, um, so the problem is, is that the duty of a Roman or a man, in this case, Caesar or Brutus, is to keep the truth about themselves from their wives. So this is what really drives them mad. Let's going back to the wound now, the wound in the thigh. I think there's some important things you should know. One is it is the first knife wound in the text. So when she does this to, when she, when she um, pierces her thigh, right? That's the first knife wound, but it isn't the last. Um, the second thing you should note is there are five additional characters who will be stabbed in the text. She does the first one, right? This bold little woman, right? But then there are five more. And then we also discover that the body, it bleeds, it feels pain, and it dies. And it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, this is gonna happen to us. And then I wanna talk a little bit about the impact of Portia's wound. Uh, three things that it sort of communicates. One is it foreshadows what's to come. Two, it develops this, this character, Portia. We learn more about her from this. One incident, this one line in the text that is, it is very subtle and it's often missed. And then we get to see like a feminist approach to the text. So for one, it establishes a very brutal pattern. Right? So we, she does that to herself, and then it happens multiple times um, in the text. It also, in terms of character development, shows her moral courage, right? She wants to do the right thing. She wants to know the truth. She wants to protect Brutus. Um, it also reinforces, this wound reinforces that she can keep his secret. Look, Brutus, if I can suffer this pain, then I can take whatever it is that you are withholding from me, right? It takes her, it converts her emotional pain and makes it physical. It shows her, it also shows her ability to endure physical pain, which is oftentimes indicative of what a man is capable of. It validates her claim on Brutus. Um, it directs attention inward, and it also leaves her vulnerable. And then it defines the self by masculine expectations. This is something that a man should, um, that can, a man can endure. But we see that Portia is doing this. And then the last impact that we see is that it eliminates the physical difference that separates her from her husband. So essentially, I just wanted to share with you um, just how the women are portrayed in the text and the impact that Calpurnia and both, and both Calpurnia and Portia um, play or the role that they play.